Hey guys, this is Toby Mathis, and you are in part three of a three-part series on estate planning for wealthy individuals. All right, we are talking about creating a legacy here, and we're also talking about 11 steps, and we've covered nine of them thus far. So we're going to go over the last two steps, which is steps number 10 and steps number 11, right? So we're going to make sure we do it. So part three is about what you do when you pass. So for you, obviously, there's not much to do. You pass away. But what's being left behind? And what we want to be clear on is that we've created a structure. The first thing we did in part one is we created a system for what happens with our business. So we might have a business. We might have our real estate in a holding company uh, where we might have all of our other real estate diving into one diving into one box. So we have all of our pieces of real estate. This can be different states. So we could have all these different homes and one of them could be like, this could be North Carolina. We could have Georgia. We could have Texas. We could have Nevada. We could have Wyoming, whatever it is. And we all have it feeding into a single receptacle as far as holding all the real estate. We may have other investments too. We might have our other cash. And all of that is already put in place. And all of this um, is being held in a, what I call a suitcase. Just pretend that's a big old suitcase. I'll put a handle on the top. And everything is just sitting in there, which is your living trust. So we'll just call this our living trust. Now, I might have assets that normally would be in a living trust, but maybe I own some things out here like a car. Maybe there's a checking. I might have some things that are still outside. And what we really care about is what if something happens to me? What about all these things? Who will be designated? Who can handle them? What process do we have to go through, if any, with a court system? What is the actual, me you know, uh, the mechanics of it? So number one, with a living trust, and this is really step number 10, is avoiding probate through using our living trust and or, it's actually going to always almost be and, having a charity or some other organization sitting out here, a 501c3, which is either a family foundation or a family public charity, where I am making sure that there's something outside my estate. Both of these avoid nasty probate, and that's our step, that is step 10 in a, in a T, is avoiding having to go to a judge to have an asset transferred. If I already have it in the living trust and I'm married, my spouse 99% of the time steps in and acts like the trustee. You might, they might have a co-trustee, but they're going to be as, a, as, as, you might have them specifically, hey, as, or spouse passes and you're left, you're stepping in and just handling things in that living trust both spouses pass away or it's just you and you have a successor trustee designated. And like I said in part two, I'm not a big fan of having your heirs be the trustees, especially if they're beneficiaries because they're just, they're not going to listen to you unless there's somebody else designated that has to act with them like a bank or a trust department, an attorney or a, a licensed fiduciary, like a CPA attorney or, or a trust company. So a trust company would be a part of a bank more than likely, or there's some out there that are just operate individually. But let's just say that you had a Wells Fargo trust department and you had them, you had a good relationship with the bank or a local, you know, ABC bank, your local bank, and you had a great relationship with them. And you say, I want you to be my trustee and watch over these things. Then each one of these, You'll remember in part two, I talked about having a buy-sell agreement. Maybe that business just becomes cash because of something that happens. The business goes away and I had a buy-sell agreement with my partners. So all of a sudden, I don't have to worry about running that business anymore. With the real estate, I may still have that real estate operating and I like the cash flow. So I want to make sure that it continues. So I have a manager. Maybe I have an heir that is designated as the manager. And I say in my document, hey, uh, or you just, it could be in your LLC document here to say, I want the manager to be my heir. And then in your living trust, you say to the trustee, 
hey, I want to make sure that this individual continues as long as they want to, to manage that LLC. That's to the extent that I'd probably give a, uh, a descendant an absolute right to control things. And maybe over here on the cash, I'd probably just leave that up to a trustee. Just let them manage that. There's not much to it. But these ones, those assets can continue to generate income for years and years and years. I don't want to liquidate them. The problem with probate is that they take an inventory and they pretty much get rid of everything. If you die as a sole proprietor, I'm sorry, it's not surviving. That business is done. If I die and I have an entity, I want to make sure that that's not getting locked up in a probate process, which might take two or three years and it's not able to operate or it's operating under court supervision. That's just not effective. So with the living trust, I can avoid that completely. So with the living trust, I've avoided the probate process on all of these assets. I may have a small probate left outside, which is fine. Most states, they have a mechanism so that if I pass away, my spouse could take ownership or if we don't own things together, let's say that if, let's just say you're the second spouse to pass away. That's the hardest part. There might be a quick process that you can do in your department of uh, motor vehicles might allow an affidavit to transfer to depending on who the, the beneficiary is. It might just be the trust. So you have the trustee saying, hey, move this over here. Same thing with the checking. Or if it's joint tenants, you and your spouse are on the, on the, tru- on the checking account together. So one of you passes, it doesn't matter. But if you both pass, then it goes to the trust. Worst case scenario, these assets get poured in here via a pour over will. And this is, would be handled via low, a low asset probate. You probably not going to have to go to court. But whatever the case, the sole beneficiary is your living trust. So even if you have to probate a couple of assets, uh, it's not a bad idea to file a probate anyway, even if there's no assets, because A, there's nothing that you're, you're not putting any of this stuff out in a public record. That's all private because it's in the trust. But what you're doing is you're saying, hey, any creditors out there of the estate, you have so many days to make a claim or you're barred. So you still may want to do that. The other thing I use pour over wills for is for guardianship provisions for, for minors. So that, I mean, I don't want my living trust being part of a, of an, of a whole filing. You have to do it under seal. Like if you ever looked at the Kobe Bryant case, you notice they had a, they had a living trust, but there was still disputes going on with one of the children being left out. And you'll see in those pleadings that they said, hey, the living trust is filed under seal and in, in camera review by the, by the judge. In other words, it's not part of the official record. You can't go pull it up. So nobody can see what's in here. I may say, hey, you know what? I had a checking account with $15,000 in it. Okay, I'm okay with that. Sole beneficiary is this guy here. I may put in here the guardians. Hey, I have guardianship provisions. I want my best friends as opposed to a relative to watch over my minor children if something happens. That's appropriate to be here because that's a public record, that's fine. Or if I have specific instructions about burial or what I want done with my body, I've seen litigation over what to do with mom and dad's body, where they get buried. There was two families fighting over East Coast, West Coast, or was mom to be cremated or buried. You wanna make sure it's in some documents so somebody can file it and I don't want it in the living trust because I don't want that document in a public record. I'd rather it be in something like a pour over will where it's a really, really simple document with only one thing, beneficiaries living trust. Makes it very, very simple. Plus it's so low asset, shouldn't have to go to court. If you do, it's gonna be very, very minor and it's not gonna be all these assets, the value jacking up the cost. You may have a really quick matter. Hopefully we avoid it altogether and you have everything in your living trust when you pass and then we don't have anything to worry about. Once you are gone, this is step 11, it's administering the legacy plan or the estate. Everything goes in here, right? Everything's in here. So these assets are no longer in your name. Everything is now in the suitcase. Everything's now in the trust and that suitcase becomes irrevocable. That living trust is now irrevocable and it's simply your irrevocable trust to go on. In many cases, you start them out at 365 years. If you're using like our jurisdiction here in Nevada, it's 365 years. And you just say it's for the benefit of my descendants. So immediately you're shaking your head going, what the heck does that even mean? 
It means all these assets are owned by this suitcase, this trust, the cash, everything, and it's generating income. And your trustee has written instructions from you saying, pay my beneficiaries enough money for their health, education, maintenance, and support. That's at its basic. You could be as elaborate as you want. You could say, hey, you know what? Only for school or, hey, health, education, maintenance, and support. And if they want to open up a business, we will loan them money at prime plus two or something like that. Like you could do stuff where you're putting in there um, your request of how you want your trustees to manage it. The trustee will always be either somebody you name in the beginning so you and your spouse pass away, you have a named trustee, or you may have picked a, a trustee that's a particular bank or something like that. And then after that, all trustees have to be fiduciaries. That's how our documents are written. It's either going to be a licensed CPA, an attorney, or a trust bank or trust department. And what it basically is, is your beneficiaries, whoever your beneficiaries are, which is your descendants, so it's all this big group of people coming out on down the line. It's my, it's my kids. It's then my grandkids. It's then my great grandkids. And when lo- one line passes, it goes down. It's called persterpes to the next. So these, these, these beneficiaries are sitting there getting these benefits over many, many years of this trust. And you have a trustee sitting over it, which could be an institution basically doling out the money according to your written instructions. And it just continues to exist. On the charity side, you could do what's called founder share when you put them together and say, I have veto rights on my shares and I give these rights to, and you could have a convention. Hey, it's going to go to my eldest child and they have veto rights, or it's going to go to my children, my descendants in each line. So to my kids first, then to my kids, kids second, and things like that. Or my eldest seven descendants may sit on the board and make directions. But any any individual in my family may be an employee and receive reasonable compensation for their services on behalf of the charity. So they would actually have to do stuff. Hint, hint, they're going to be doing fundraising because they actually want to get paid, right? But they go out there and they're, and they're, they're basically working for whatever it is, the legacy that you created. And again, sometimes you have real estate legacies that are sitting in those charities and they're just continuing to perpetuate and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And your family is able to work for them so long as they're meeting their charitable object, uh, objectives, they're entitled to reasonable pay. And that's a nice tool. Nobody can ever take it away. A divorce a bad accident, bad business decisions. They cannot take that away from your family. Over here, no matter what's going on, a piece of real estate burns down. They can't take the rest of the real estate. It's isolated. We already have it structured. Hey, I get these two spa- these two des- descendants are out r- driving drunk one night and run over a busload of nuns. Massive lawsuit. They can't come in here and take these from the rest. In fact, your trustee is going to say, if there's a judgment creditor out there of that beneficiary, I'm not going to distribute anything. It's called credit shelter provisions. What about if one of the descendants has a medical condition where they're not able to care for themselves? Let's say that uh, they've been in a bad car accident or born with a, with a, a mental defect or something. I shouldn't say defects, that's me, right? But let's just say that they have something that's causing it to where they cannot care for themselves and they have special needs and the state will step in and provide them assistance. These documents also have incorporated in them special needs provisions that say if that individual has special needs, the trustee will not distribute assets from the trust if it would cause them to lose a state benefit. In other words, there's not a situation where because they have access to, as a beneficiary to the trust, there's not a situation where that in and of itself will cause them to lose a benefit because the trustee has specific instructions to withhold any payments if so doing would cause them to lose a benefit. 
If you don't have those in there, there's plenty of cases where grandparents have left something to an autistic child where the state had been uh, giving them assistance for many years. And guess what they do? As soon as you make that kid a beneficiary, the state goes back and say, hey, great, we've been paying 18 years of assistance, 21 years, 24 years, whatever it is of assistance, we're going to go ahead and get paid back now. Thank you. And they're going to take the money from that individual. If you don't want that to happen, you put it in a trust and you make them a beneficiary and that trust has special needs provisions, you're going to be fine. And that's how it works. So you can create a legacy that goes on for years for your descendants. And that's who the beneficiaries are. It is your descendants and it will continue to be so. And the whole idea is that the preservation of the asset is a paramount concern, so it's growing. If you are on the charitable side, you could be doing both of these together. You could have the charity growing and your descendants continuing to serve and do service for that organization. And if they're doing it, then that's how they get paid. What you can't do is just because you're a beneficiary is say, buy me a Lamborghini, buy me a mansion. I want all the cash. Can't do it. Health, education, maintenance, support. If you need transportation, you get a Kia, right? You're going to get reasonable accommodations. Hey, you're not able to make it on your own. Like, let's look at your resources. Let's look at your job. You're not able to make it on your own. Here's some additional funds to make sure you're not homeless. You're not starving. You're not without transportation. If you get into college, you're going to have payment for it. You're not going to be in a situation. But if it's a $200,000 a year, like art school, sorry. Like, you're going to have to justify it to a trustee and it's going to have to be reasonable. If it's something that's kind of a crazy uh, endeavor, they're probably going to say no, right? And again, you're putting people in charge who are reasonable human beings to stand in your shoes while you're gone to say, here was, here's, here's John Smith or whoever it is. Here's their estate. Here's Toby's estate. Here's future generations. This is what Toby instructed us. This is what the trust says. Here's how you this is how you access the funds. In part one, I talked about uh, clients of mine that have put in their travel and get outside the United States and do international travel. Put that in your document. Hey, trustee, every year, send them outside the country for 10 days, seven days, whatever it is. Probably, probably nowadays you'd want to go seven days. Have them leave the United States for seven days a year and the trust can cover it, right? You could put in there, Reasonable accommodations, reasonable flights. So it's not like they're going to fly first class. They're going to get a coach ticket. If they want to upgrade it, they could do it out of their pocket. But it'll get them out of the country and going and seeing some other cultures, right? If that's important to you, just draft it right in your document. Now there's a trustee looking at instructions. Hey, we're supposed to do this. Or you want them to be an investor. You could say on the first rental property they get, whatever they put as a down payment, the trust will match, Okay, I could do that. Or the total benefit you could receive out of your trust is capped at whatever amount you make for yourself if you want your kids to work, if they're able. So you could put, if you're of working, if you have working ability, whatever, that you cannot receive more from this than you make for yourself. So if you're worried about your beneficiaries just freeloading on the trust, you could say, nope. If you make 20000 the trust could give you a maximum of 20000 a year. That's it. Oh, maybe I need to get out there and have a work ethic, right? Yeah, because you don't want someone just sitting back trying to bleed this thing, right? And we don't know what the future is going to hold for our beneficiaries and what our descendants are going to be like. So you have to have written instructions that will give a certain amount of leeway to your trustee so that they can say this is what the instructions are. You do that, you're going to have a great estate and you're going to have people that actually future generations that know who you were, know your name and appreciate what you created on their behalf. And again, I've said this before, anybody can create this. Even if you don't have all these assets, even if you don't have a bunch of cash, you can create the suitcase and insure yourself so that the money flows into it when you're passed away. So if you're a younger person, I've never understood this, why lawyers always talk people out of actually putting together an estate plan when they're in their 20s. Because they're like, this is a perfect time to be thinking 200, 300 years in the future. It's going to guide your decision-making process. 
And it's going to enable you to start thinking in long term as opposed to short term self gratification. If I know that I'm creating something for a longer period of time and I want to create wealth, I need to be thinking long term. I shouldn't be thinking, hey, I'm just living for today. Woo, 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 right? You're never going to create a legacy that way. But if you put something together, all I have to do is insure myself. And even if you're somebody who is on the starting phase and something happens to you that trips you up along the way, you pass early, something happens, you and a spouse, something happens to one of you or both of you, you could still have the legacy that you want created However you d- decide to visualize it, there's really an unlimited way, number of ways that you can create an estate and whatever it is that you want is up to you. It's, it's up to us to draft things. Guys like me, what we do is we listen to our clients and we say, this is what you want. This is what's important to you. Here's how we can make that a reality. And then you have a beautiful estate that can last hundreds of years going into the future. And that's what we love. So we covered 11 steps to creating a really awesome estate plan. This was the third part of a three-part series. If you like this type of content, click that like button, share it, subscribe, leave us comments, and let us know what else we can create for you. And uh, the best thing you could do is share the idea that people, anybody, can create a legacy out there. If all they have to do is dream it up, and the rest of it, there's plenty of ways to create it. It's not expensive. It's not complicated. It's not like hoodoo voodoo. If you create something, by the way, you can change it at any time. It's fully revocable, but also amendable. It's really easy to amend these types of things. So anybody, and I mean anybody out there who's working, who wants to do the investing and things like that, anybody can create a legacy.